of their obsession with, with hanging out with the client, and hanging out with where the most of the capital was. Little did they know that they missed an enormous opportunity to create uh, what we now know as middle class in America. And is it too late? Well, it's hard to know. Clearly, suburbia is under a lot of pressure because of mobility, the, the kind of the, the, the problems of, of, of energy, etc., and the, the, the enormous uh, kind of gobbling up of space that uh, suggests that intelligent design, not the kind that you might know about, but intelligent design of the kind that we do here, um, it would be an, extremely interesting to pursue. And nevertheless, very little of that happens. If I look back, uh, it, of course it's the new urbanists, and look, they all, they all became millionaires. They made a lot of money. When some of my best friends uh, uh, made, uh, are today enormously rich, based, based on, on uh, uh, taking on suburbia in, in, in their particular way. Most architects this are, of course, disdainful of this particular project for reasons that are probably deeply embedded in the architect's role as sort of the handmaid of the rich, if I can use that word, and not understanding that, the, that being part of, of the great, great democratic movement of building cities uh, was something that we should have been part of. In some way, the Europeans are very different that way. They think of housing as being a fundamental piece of architecture. If, you, if the architectural project doesn't have housing in it, it is no longer an architectural project. It's just kind of pleasing the wealth. So we have missed out on this in this country in a very interesting way. And of course, architects operate in suburbia, in wealthy suburbia, by customizing housing. But they never were involved in, in working on the subdivision. The subdivision, of course, is a creature that has, it has evolved in, in, in American uh, um, development. And it's a peculiarly interesting one. Very efficient one, extremely graphically simple. If you see it from the sky, you know it. If I ask you to drive or draw it, you can draw it as well as you can draw a plan of a house. It is so, uh, and it of course is, is, is repeated over and over again. And since it never knows how to stop, you get very ragged edges around it, and now you have so-called sprawl. Uh, you know, the only American that I can think of that has sort of had radical notions about suburbia is actually Michael Sorkin, who, who you might not know. Unfortunately, I haven't been able to rope him in one of these days. Maybe we have. We can. He's an extremely interesting, smart guy, very funny, writes a very acerbic critique. And he teaches, he runs the urban design program at, at City College in New York. But Michael has done some very interesting suburban propositions. And uh, there's another one, uh, also a former student of mine, uh, whose name is, is uh, let me my age, um, uh, Wes Jones, who's done a, a, a spectacular project uh, many years ago on suburbia. So when I uh, encounter Peter Truman, in Europe, of all places, in, in, in Holland, that's less surprising because the Dutch have clearly been involved in the project. In fact, the whole country is a design project. It's a very peculiar one, lots of interesting things going on in, 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 in Holland, and I think that you would understand Rampulas if you hadn't been in Holland, but when you're there, you understand it. It's a very small country, with, with, and it, there's not much space. Uh, that's why they probably tried to col colonialize the world and the Flying Dutchman has been all over trying to, to uh, take over places. Anyhow, Peter Trummer is not Dutch. He is Austrian and uh, he's very unusual Austrian because he's not one of these that seem to be on the edge of suicide every day. But in fact, uh, a, a, a gregarious, uh, wonderfully uh, uh, inspired guy that has, a, that has taken on suburbia in a very interesting way that we will look at today, I'm sure. And, uh, and Peter has had, he's actually worked uh, with a very interesting guy in Arizona, but I've had the pleasure to see the work of the students at the Berlache, where he teaches. Berlache, of course, is a, is a venerable kind of private institution, an unusual one, 
that exists in Rotterdam, uh, and uh, that's where he teaches. Uh, in the, incidentally, he, he is a colleague of uh, Ethi, who was here just not too long ago. And um, Peter's work is, is uh, fascinating in so many ways. And uh, as you will see today, it is, not, it is right in the bunch of, of uh, what I would call formalists. But the interesting thing is that it, it, the formality that you see in his work is driven, it comes from another source that I think is in fact a very uh, well-read and, and complicated source. It is not driven by form itself, interestingly enough, although it might at first look, appear that way. Anyhow, it is a pleasure to have Peter here. He's only here very briefly, he's leaving tomorrow. And uh, he, he will, uh, I think he leaves early in the morning, so you're gonna, uh, if, you, if you're interested in talking more, more to him, there won't be much time for that. But uh, anyhow, Peter is here now, and it'll be fun to hear what he says. Thanks, Lars, for the introduction. And uh, for the people who know that I was here four years ago, uh, probably you know also what have shifted, you know, I'm not anymore introduced by Sanford Quinter, the one who represented form, but I'm introduced by Lars. So I wanted to know what happened to me, and I think to continue actually the presentation today, I actually had the opportunity five years ago to introduce a topic, you know, that I started to work with, and basically, um, Today I want to show you the results. And of course, that results have to happen with my generation being embedded in that kind of early 90s with a question of what that kind of new formalism meant to us. But due to my very strange curricula, I somehow had to formulate a kind of identity that is on the one hand side based, what Lars would say, uh, the culture towards the production of the city through the housing, but how do we have another understanding that that kind of production is not driven by ideas, or the question is where do these ideas come from? So what happened to me is that four years ago I introduced a topic of population thinking, I want to actually hear uh, say thanks to Isabel and Etienne that give me the opportunity that I wrote an article now on that. But basically it was also that I want to introduce you here again the topic that I'm going to work in the next uh, four years basically on the idea of urbanism in the age of biopolitics. Now, to come briefly now uh, to, the, to the point, the reason why I became interested in the idea of population thinking was basically because there was a strange thing happening in the discourse of architecture. Suddenly, and the, I think uh, someone who held uh, a lecture a couple of days ago by BV, you could see that there was a kind of disturbance between the kind of essentialist, the idea that that types or pre-given ideas formulate the way how we want to think of the city, or the others, the kind of new materialists that basically started to think that no, in matter, there is a kind of intelligence that is more real than our ideas. And in that confrontation, I decided to go on the materialist side and basically uh, deal with that. Now, why did I do that? I did it because there's a very strange thing, because even the people that did hardcore research on the idea of how cities engaged or became the manifestation of material processes, even they in the end said it's all driven by preconceived typologies. And one of the guys I think starts to become more and more interesting for me is uh, this person called uh, Muratori, who basically in the 50s uh, made enormous amount of research of trying to understand Venice or other cities in all their centuries as the material processes of a particular economical and social environment. But the interesting thing is, even when he mapped that enormous amount of cities, where you have to imagine they mapped out every little plan that the whole city has produced, he would still say that the whole differentiation of that city is purely produced, produced by what they call collective consciousness. So even these people that have only engaged in understanding the material components would in the end say there is that uh, consciousness. Now why I'm, why I'm saying that is because it had an effect of how we produce architecture. Because all his work basically later on influenced Rossi and all the whole Italian generation. So he was the foundation for that. Now, interesting enough, that these were then the studies that made. Now, as we know, 
you know, uh, uh, the population is had another idea. They had an idea that there are ideas that are embedded in this material, and I, I think. Uh, uh, thanks to Manuel de Landa, who basically gave an introduction to all of that. These are some examples. For example, one of them was that in, in physics, for example, that idea of matter that suddenly a kind of organization of molecules change into a kind of minimal surface. Yeah? Uh, or that in biology, the idea of population overcome these typologies, you know, where basically a population only survives in order to be uh, different, in order to be differentiated from other species. So these were all processes. Now, that went so far that also it started to be in economics. Now, I don't know if you, if you know uh, this person. Uh, this is Kristall, uh, uh, Walter Kristall. Well, they were interested in thinking of populations as an instrument of how is it distributed on density and what is the economics that drives that density. So if, for example, what he came up with is a diagram on the left side where he basically started to realize that in order to understand how density is formating in a geographical sense, what we have to think of is that every individual has a different behavior, has a different behavior according to economics, and so he builds up this kind of whole net of central place theory where basically a relationship between economics drives the centrality of people. Now, the interesting thing is on the, on the left side, on the right side, this is a diagram by uh, uh, a new dialogue to, with nature, you know, where basically the, you realize that this complexity that is driven by the people is actually not something that can be mapped as, an, as, a, as a static element, but basically is a dynamical environment where you basically can see that there's a redistribution. These are points that basically identify the amount of density of population, and there is a reorganization of the density according to other programs to occur. Now, that was a kind of brief introduction, but it became also a political concept population. I think, and probably this is the strongest statement I came across which basically started with Foucault, who said, and these are the books that have now been recently translated into German and English, lectures that he gave 89, where he started to say, the population as an entity became a power, uh, became actually the means of pol uh, political strategy. So with the 18th century, it started to happen that we started to orchestrate in a certain way a population statistically, we started to map them out, we started to make operations on them, and we started to basically start to affect, uh, through political means, the, the most essence of, uh, of our daily life, and that is also living. Now, this brings me now, of course, to the lecture today, and what I want to show you is how are these policies basically affecting our daily life what does it mean to architecture, or basically to urbanism? Now, uh, why do I start with that image? A lot of us think that if we think of Serda, we think of him basically as the man who did this uh, plan for Barcelona. But what is interesting with Serda, that he was the first one who defined in Europe the definition of urbanism. He had to find a word that is not anymore related to the idea of the city, and of course, others uh, that are Spanish-speaking probably are much more. But he, uh, interesting, <coughs> but he defined basically another term that means how do we can find a name that we can use in order to develop housing and housing as the as a massive idea in, uh, to organize our cities. And so he came up with this ur uh, urbanism. Now a lot of people think that the idea of urbanism is basically only a technical thing. But what he developed is, uh, in the Foucaultian sense, actually a whole bunch of uh, bases that define urbanism to happen. So what he did, he said he, there is not only a technical base, which means basically the way how the streets look like and so on, there has to be an administrative one. There has to be someone who uh, takes control over this process. There has to be a legal base. That basically means we have to figure out to whom does land belong and uh, how do we deal with private to public land. And he came up with, a, with an economical thing, which basically meant how does that all fit into the economics of the housing market. And he, of course, came up with a political base where he says all that together has to be a political strategy. Now, why I'm saying that is because with Serra, you could say in Europe, there was the first, or with, with the map of Barcelona, there was the first kind of instrumentality of making urbanism an operative means 
for uh, inheriting the, the life of people. And uh, so what I want to show you in principle is how this kind of operation then uh, took over, for example, the project of the suburb. Now what I've done in the last four years, so Sanford is not here anymore, so he cannot ask me anymore what you're doing, yeah, he can only ask me hopefully why you do that, uh, but uh, this is what I did. I have chosen five different cities in the last year. And what I've done, I've chosen them out of two um, different means. One is that the city were growing, so that means the city were growing through housing. And the other thing is, each of the city had a different way in which the economic was a relationship to uh, uh, politics. So for example, in Amsterdam, it's the only city that had over 90 years a social housing program that after that 90 years, it's now that, uh, given to the market that the market more or less designs the housing environment for, for the city. Madrid is probably the last uh, uh, city that still is in control of their own housing production. So that basically the city takes care in order to operate the houses. Now Shanghai became very interesting because it became this very, very strange hybrid between uh, the state providing money but also operating as a private company. Then, of course, uh, uh, I had to go to Phoenix, uh, uh, probably the wildest stuff I've ever seen in terms uh, of, of non-governmental, uh, or let's say, uh, governmental treatment in support of economics. And uh, today, uh, this year, I'm in Mexico City, probably the only city where I think it's hard to survive as a human being. Uh, now, what have, what have I looked at? I've looked at the edge of the city, now I wanted to understand what is the architectural knowledge that is produced in order to uh, uh, make that city grow, you know? And what is, it, how does it come that a kind of Hilbersheimer is occurring in Shanghai, you know? How is it possible that this model is in Shanghai? What is the, no, what is the knowledge and the economical basis in terms of urbanism that drive that project? Or uh, in the case of Mexico City, who is, who is trying to lay out these informal cities of Nazareth? And of course, I came uh, to the States where I wondered how does it come, what is the architectural knowledge that basically produces that enormous amount of growth? And so what you can see is that I looked into the edge of the city and tried to more and less understand how does that regime of urbanism suddenly start to go and hit against the natural environment. So driven by all of that, basically, was one kind of phil philosophical concept that Guattari presented to me in that time, that basically said that we cannot distinguish nature from culture, that we, we cannot, or the whole French philosophy basically tried to learn us, that we cannot detach anymore that this relationship. And the question is that whatever we produce, there are social, psychological, and other ecologies that take place to our human being. So in that kind of confrontation, I went to the edge and asked myself, is within that territory another form of urbanism possible that is embedded in the forces that constrain them? So how have I done that? Uh, this is the way how I'm, I'm working. So first is, you know, one part is looking into the processes that are at stake in the cities in order to for make them grow. Uh, you could also say these are processes that more or less try to see how um, are the regimes manifesting themselves materially. So the second thing is to go into the regimes that Sarah described, what are the economical, administrative, legislative, and technological knowledges that are used in order for that to grow. And then the third part is to project uh, the look into the ecologies of the terrain that operate. And the fourth thing, which I think is the most important one, is how do you project new forms of neighborhoods? Now, since uh, uh, I think we're, uh, before I want to go into this Phoenix project and show that a little bit detail, I want to show you basically, since I'm in an education environment, um, um, a little bit how I work. So in order to produce these things, for example, for, uh, for Madrid, uh, I'm, 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 I'm not applying an idea. I'm using a kind of assembly uh, process. So what we're doing is, we, we have a kind of associative protocol starting from a facade component 
going to the environmental envelope, to the housing unit, and so basically scaling up the process from the detail to the large object. Now, how does it look like? You basically design a kind of component that can uh, vary, you know, on the smaller scale, you know, and then basically has the same effect on larger scale. So, for example, here is uh, uh, how certain kind of environmental uh, uh, things operate. And then between the detail and that kind of master plan, you have a kind of associative model that can react on the site, for example, as in a plan. Now, in China, and uh, I have to honestly say, uh, which I have never done here publicly to, uh, to Chris, who basically gave the title for that research called synthetic vernacular. So Chris, uh, it is. Uh, basically, here we try to understand in China, in Shanghai, how can we learn from the material organization of vernaculars. So for example, uh, uh, if, if someone ever has been in China, you can see that you have enormous like, kind of wetland, and how can you learn basically from uh, non-planned settlements? So here, for example, you see one of these neighborhoods. Each of the uh, housing units are different from each other. Uh, they are around, uh, generating around of uh, three to 5,000 houses. And in principle, they organize a kind of social population that has a diversity that is enlarged from really small families to large families and different income groups. So, or you have a different kind of housing unit that organizes different kind of organization of courtyards that can be used for different kind of programmatical functions and produce a landscape of different kind of uh, uh, program fields. Now this, for, so as an introduction to see, this is the kind of work basically that has been uh, elaborated over the years. And in the end, instead of a master plan, the idea is how can you think these models as growing? So in the case of uh, Shanghai, you can see that there's a strategy to learn from that vernacular. Now that brings me now to actually the project uh, that I want to present you today, and that is uh, Phoenix, Arizona. As I've mentioned in the beginning, the reason why I was there is basically that I identified within the states a kind of relationship that never occurred somewhere else. On the one hand side, there is enormously amount of knowledge in urbanism that even affects uh, Europeans, but at the same time, no one really understands what drives that model that organizes uh, suburbia in the states. Now, uh, if someone sees Phoenix, Arizona, uh, of course, for someone like me who has a totally um, who, did, who didn't even know how to move out of the airport when I arrived there, because I didn't know that you have to hire a car, because I thought that, that not even a taxi did work. So I got an idiotic uh, European, you know, arrived. Uh, but uh, what is interesting first is that uh, seeing that map, of course we would know Sun City, how it works, but the question is, what kind of processes are really going on here, and what have identified for over all, all these years that kind of growth? Now what you can see, and uh, is this a laser? Uh, no, I uh, thought so. It looks uh, laser-like. Uh, basically, what you can what you can see uh, and what is interesting here is that the growth of the city basically is embedded in that kind of valley, and the, the tension that is happening to Phoenix is that it sort of sort of grows out of that of that valley. Now, as you can see, um, uh, the driving force of that growth was in principle uh, already agriculture, and what is interesting here is that. Uh, since the city has only grown for uh, like uh, 40 years, uh, or basically it has really exponentially grown in the last 30 years, what happened is that the ground condition in order for making that housing to work was actually farming. And so we met this very, very strange uh, uh, man called uh, 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 Matthew Moore, who is actually a farmer and in that moment had to sell his kind of land and he basically provided us with all the information. Now, what you can see, of course, is that uh, what looks as a homogeneous uh, city, or as you look at it as a kind of a pattern, it has actually an enormous amount of diversity. So here, for example, is the population uh, density. And what was surprising to us, that it actually performs as a city, which means that it has that, a density that also any other city has. It also has a household income that, you, that varies in a very interesting way. And so that, that, that means that, the, of course, it's enormously stretched uh, landscape, but it still provides all the diversity a city would need. Or it even has housing variations that have 
it's been very surprising to us that are not only densities that we would uh, call suburbia that have other densities as well. So where, where does that come from? And what is surprising to hear is this image that basically shows that even on 175th Street, that is basically, I think, I don't know, divided by eight, uh, 25 miles out of the city center, you would have suddenly three-story uh, high-rise, uh, or not high-rise, but three-story apartment buildings. So what are these processes that go on there, and what is the knowledge that operates in that? Now, as we saw the map, we suddenly identified a very interesting organization. Of course, this is the Jefferson Grid, and we all know how it works. But if you look very closely, you can suddenly realize uh, of course, what we would understand that here on these corners we have some commercial functions, then we have the kind of quarter miles, and suddenly there reoccurs within that uh, 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 quarter mile a kind of uh, empty spot. So the so the question came: Where is that? Where is that knowledge coming from? Who is actually providing uh, these things to to look like the same? And what is it then that transforms it? So what we, came, what we suddenly identified is two regimes. One, of course, was uh, uh, the kind of manufacturing process, the kind of idea that a city can be done as a project. You know? And that, I think that's a, a Levy down thing, where Levy in more or less showed that in order to operate on housing, we just take a whole neighborhood as one assembly line. And that assembly line still works. But what makes the layout so unique? And so we came to that kind of paper. Uh, this is a paper from uh, President Hoover government of 1932. Uh, and it basically called for uh, a conference on home building and home ownership. And that conference on home ownership produced uh, this kind of uh, 11 uh, books, whereby uh, we found, especially through an introduction of, of Keller Easterly, uh, the first one, which basically was the planning for residential district. Now the whole idea was, how do you turn uh, housing into money? So how do you turn basically uh, housing into a profitable thing? So this was the model that operated. It was a kind of racial uh, area model that redistributed the program on the, on the left. And this was the architectural model that more or less implanted that uh, model to work. So you can see here already the, the programmatic distribution. But what became interesting, it became actually a study of the culture of how to subdivide land and how to make land in such a way it's subdivided that it can perform all this program. So this is the Howard study where, for example, one of these subdivisions is basically based on uh, 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 one organization of, uh, of lot the subdivision by ha having access to one house, then the irregular pattern, the depth of the two patterns, three, three lane, the hexagon model, uh, the Kulesak one, and of course every one of that lot became suddenly mechanically uh, uh, measured in any kind of money that has to go in there in order to, to prove that it can work. So it has to go in there in a kind of uh, uh, money that you need to take for putting any kind of in, uh, infrastructure there. Then, of course, they all have been compared, you know, and uh, have been uh, evaluated uh, in order to use. But the same thing was happening to housing, you know. All these houses were basically studied in the way of what they cost. But what became interesting is that in these very early models, there was already the idea to have a quite diversity of housing environments from uh, uh, detached one family houses to really raw uh, flats. So if you look then into the housing models where basically every money became calculated under the square foot of every house, interestingly enough, it produced that result. The result that the neighborhood is not a question of just a purely monofunctional organization of one type of housing typology, but it has actually the idea of diversifying neighborhood of very kind of, of, of dwellings. So based with that kind of hypothesis, the question uh, became a little bit to our research, I mean, what is intriguing in that and how would you reestablish uh, such a condition? Now, in order to do that work, these are the papers that uh, came out in uh, 
in 38, uh, which were then uh, the planning for profitable housing neighborhoods that then presented to the banks, and that's basically the rules how to subdivide land in order to make it homogeneous. So what you can see is that in examples of what is good and bad, you know, you basically realize that the only target in order to know if a subdivision operates to its best performance is how to equalize land to the most homogeneous pattern that is, that is possible. And that homogeneous pattern takes actually that layout uh, so that every individual, every housing block becomes as, as close as possible next to the other. But if you look in a current situation, and that's the master plan of our friend, who is the farmer out there, you know, that's basically his land he's selling. The interesting thing is that kind of diversity manifests themselves now that you have a kind of very wide, um, uh, ha uh, enormous amount of um, uh, different kind of income groups next to each other, but they're all segregated by a kind of infrastructure. So in order to perform that, uh, as I have told before, it can only go by basically erasing the ground. And these are these machines that are out there that basically make it flat. But for you, probably this is uh, all known and uh, probably uh, very simple. But I mean, it was quite an uh, amazing thing to me to realize that the kind of whole uh, operation can only work by ignoring the ground as, a, as an entity, as a cultural product. But this is actually how uh, Phoenix, Arizona uh, looks like. This is the backyard of my uncle. He came there to Tucson, Arizona as a hippie. Uh, he has uh, 3,000 uh, uh, square meters, I think. And the interesting thing, what happened to him is that he sold now that kind of uh, uh, place in Tucson, Arizona because uh, around him um, all these kind of uh, swap of uh, housings uh, can happen. Now, the interesting thing is what actually produces that ecology. And so what we discovered is that there seems to be, uh, in uh, Suriname Desert, which uh, seems to be the wettest desert uh, we, uh, we have discovered, a kind of very strange ecology at stake. On the one hand side, you had a have a topographical constraint between consolidated and solidated rocks that uh, operate in that uh, Arizona Delta. And what you can see here is that Arizona is embedded in that enormously unconsolidated uh, environment. And so what is happening is through enormous amount of uh, uh, washes that are happening either through the raining season, yeah, but also through floods from the river, you, know, you basically get suddenly that in a, a, a landscape full of what they call uh, washes, which is enormous amount of grit of uh, 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 biodiversity that is happening uh, out there, and it produces this kind of uh, greenery in the middle of the desert. So here you see, for example, one of these washes, how they, o how they operate, and here you can see how they basically give an ecology to that kind of uh, 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 terrain. Now, of course, uh, why is it interesting? Because what you can see suddenly is that within the constraint of the territory, that kind of diversity starts to happen, to be ignored in order for making any operation uh, at stake. So uh, uh, now coming up to that question of what I have started in the very beginning is of course if the idea doesn't come from a regime, how can idea come from a territory itself? And so what we have uh, studied is basically to find a place where we can look into the raw desert and propose a kind of alternative model. Now, what you can see here back is that since it's nearly becoming empty, and of course that was one year ago, and I think most of the projects are more or less stopped now, but we came out there to the very, very far uh, left, outside of the valley, and we found that, that thing there. So there are projected projects, this is a broker map, out on the left, where instead of buying a kind of little piece of land, they buy now kind of um, 30 to uh, 40 uh, square miles, you know, and make it one project. Now, the project we do is, uh, what we found is Belmont, yeah, that's uh, uh, south of this little map here. And this is the kind of poster. So that's what project is, yeah, a kind of uh, 82,000 uh, housing units, yeah, in relationship to commercial function and so on. So that's a kind of, uh, uh, was a kind of weird thing, suddenly standing there in the middle of the desert and uh, uh, seeing, the, uh, seeing the stuff there. Um, so what we did now is basically 
uh, this is the site. So what you see on the top is uh, the CAP. It's the Colorado uh, 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 water. How do, you, how do you call that? Channel. Yeah, more or less. You know, to suck off you know the water from the Colorado River, and that goes into the uh, Phoenix uh, uh, area. So you take the water from one ecosystem, you know, in order for making the other one work. Now, uh, so, and so what we have done is basically, of course, it is useless to make a project there. So what we have done is similar to the kind of idea of Howard studying the 30s. We took a section of the city and tried to project a kind of new idea of urbanism as a prototypical situation. Now, how we have done that? So the first thing was, of course, how can be the terrain? How can be the terrain become an active matter? Or how can the terrain? become something that drives actively the thing. So we started to say, and, and probably we, had, we started to divide the project into a couple of uh, things. How can the terrain be read as a kind of vegetation resistance towards planning? How can it be read as an ecological environment for kind of heat island effects of radiation? Or how can it be read as a kind of uh, land value effect? So what is embedded within a territory that is not driven only by an idea, but a negotiation between the regimes and the terrain? So here, for example, this is one of the, uh, the projects where you see, for example, here the washes organizing the desert. And that is basically the kind of uh, radiation effect that is happening on that terrain due to the uh, vegetation density. So what you can see basically is that where the washes are, you have a quite a low radiation, but there where it's very raw desert, it's very high. So the, the, the first thing came is, if you use that kind of constraint as a model of subdivision, you know, what would happen if you would always, const uh, if you always would fix the ratio uh, of, uh, of greenery, what effect would it have on the notion of uh, how to the land subdivide? Now, what that produces will basically mean that uh, if you have the same amount of density of, uh, 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 of, um, uh, of vegetation, you know, it will produce different kind of lot sizes and different kind of organization how we can subdivide the land. Now, what would that do to the housing uh, project? So what you can see on the left is in order to geometricize the ratio of heat islands, you basically have to try to minimize the surface that is uh, projected onto the, uh, 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 onto the skin of the building. But in order for a cooling effect, you basically learn from a kind of vernaculars. So how does that materialize in a ground plan? So what we looked at was this is the housing market in Phoenix. So what you have basically is you can find houses between 50,000 to $1 million. Uh, uh, and of course, with a very typical ground plan between the front yard, the back yard, and so on. And so, uh, what became a, then now a, a kind of negotiation, a negotiation is how that kind of typology can transform into the ecological constraint. And so, what came up now is a kind of envelopes, envelopes that reorganize basically uh, through a series of courtyards the internal organization, but in the same time provide kind of series of housing projects that would be not happening there. So here you can see, for example, uh, some of these uh, plants, and uh, uh, i show you uh, how they work. So what you can see suddenly is that depending on the size and in the internal organization, what happens is that one of these lots can reorganize themselves from single family houses to kind of envelopes that reorganize collective housing environments, but by the courtyards, each time operate as a kind of ventilation machine, but in the same time also can become envelopes that can be re-inhabited by any, by any way. Now, uh, as an effect on that is that if you assemble them onto the site, what happens is that in order to basically uh, achieve a kind of application of that model, you see suddenly that the infrastructure not anymore kind of surrounds them, but basically it's the landscape that brings them a continuity to this kind of uh, uh, models. So here you see, for example, how that models could operate if it's applied on the site, that depending now on the subdivision, each of that model have a different density, a different uh, housing unit, and would uh, basically become something very different to the existing situation whereby a social kind of social segregation is embedded through infrastructure, 
here infrastructure more or less incorporates all the diversities that are happening. Now these models that I show you have a totally overcapacity of diversity, something that is in reality doesn't exist. Even the market doesn't, of course, produce it, but even in the market. But this overexposure of diversity basically produces the effect that the, the, the kind of uh, um, uh, housing diversity that is happening on a, a 200 hectares uh, are nearly similar to the one that the city produces as a whole. So what you can see here is basically that the kind of diversity that is happening in the, in the uh, uh, housing prices really resemble the same kind of diversity the uh, Phoenix is producing as a whole. So now, if you look, for example, how the, another model could work if we want to see how the terrain is in a kind of economical value, then you, for example, you see here what it would mean to a grid of around uh, 400 uh, square meters. Where depending now on topography, water retainment, feasibility, each of the places would have a different kind of economical value. Now that economical value in relationship to housing would mean how would you redesign a house whereby you would have the different kind of diversity that the ground has as an economic well would affect also the housing. So here are, for example, the apologies from social housing of four units to the left uh, to, uh, to a kind of huge courtyard houses, each time basically having the parameters, foot, front footage and so on, affecting the housing uh, types. Uh, applied on the side, it will produce the effect that you suddenly cannot anymore talk of one um, idea of uh, uh, urban unity, but you would suddenly find megastructures that could, for example, work as huge uh, 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 housing lots until a kind of very, very constrained uh, property where basically events can only take place within courtyards. And so in the diversity of that production, there is a renegotiation between the ecology of the land versus the ecology uh, that is socially embedded in there. Here you see how that thing would work, you know. And here you can basically see that you produce a kind of neighborhood where there is a real a relationship between the outside space and the inner courtyard. And each of those houses more or less will perform a kind of different economical feasibilities. Now, why all that said? Because, you know, um, uh, this is now basically where that kind of research goes on now. This is the city of Mexico. It's the first time that I have moved out from the edge to the inner city, and that's because of a very simple reason. It's the only city that is decaying in the middle, and it's the first time that I'm going to look at the city as in itself, as an ecology. That means basically how does the city in its, as, as an entity work as a, uh, within its uh, biophysical elements. So to come to a conclusion, I think I want to basically propose one thing that, that Foucault uh, provided recently, where he came up and said, well, what, what really happens in the whole idea about the uh, uh, biopolitics, the question will be what kind of milieus are we going to design, you know? And the, the question of these milieus, that means what kind of events are going to take place within the future of that our plans is basically the target of our thing. And I think in that sense, I want to think for example, Lars and all these people that for a long time already started to ask ourselves what kind of emotions you know, and sensations are produced by the city itself. So in that sense, I want to thank you for listening to that. Thank you. We are willing to take questions. Can I ask something? Yeah. I mean, since I, since I don't know how to teach, uh, is that common knowledge to every one of you? What? Uh, the kind of stuff of the 30s? Oh, no. It's shocking to say that that document that you showed me now years ago is not commonly circulated. And it's an amazing document. And it is really that which drove suburbia. I mean, I, I'm convinced that the planner of, of Houston, who appeared in the 40s, uh, named Elifrit, uh, 
must have seen this document in some way, because the model that he drew in a very, very simple manner uh, of, of Houston uh, is clearly in that same category of thinking. But I, I have never seen this on a, on a, in a studio, because, I mean, we don't do suburbia here, even if we are in the middle of it. And it's not, it's not, it's never been a project. I've been trying to push it, but uh, it's, it's not appealing, because there's maybe no way this suddenly gives you an, a, a real insight to how it actually was made and how it can now, by bringing ecology into the picture, the whole apparatus changes. Because as you said, it needed a tabula rasa in order to do, yes. because it had nothing to do with the environment. It had only to do with property and accessibility. And, and, and it, it is actually a productive landscape of aquaculture that for housing, you know? I mean, that became interesting, you know? So, that, uh, so, so there is already something at stake that order makes that happen, yeah? I mean, I mean, why I'm asking that is because, you see, how I see the work yeah, is not so much only as a kind of new materialist uh, proposal. This is something I'm interested in, yeah, as, a, as an idea. What, but it actually is the evolution of a kind of 20th century neighborhood models where the idea of social cohesion is actually the one that is questionable. But it always was a projected idea. I mean, the garden city model as a kind of uh, idea how to behave co a cooperative collectively, you know? The idea of the German Siedlung, yeah? I, I don't know if that is a, a definition you're using here that basically identifies suddenly a kind of class environment, yeah? Or then you have uh, the whole project of Aldo van Eyck of Team 10 in the 60s, you know, where a kind of idea of a new collective operated, you know, with landscape. So that, so I see that work embedded in that thing and the, the idea of the um, uh, 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 sort of uh, uh, Adam Smith or that kind of models uh, appeared for me in a very, very strange way because no, there is no... What's, what's very interesting what you're saying, when modernism came to this country, it was floated across the ocean and in the process, old politics was removed from it. It's sort of, nobody seems to discuss politics when you, when you look at suburbia. And suburbia is highly, highly organized by political exactly. reasons. You know? I mean, it, 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 so, so this sort of inability to, to look at, at human environment as anything but form yes. is extremely problematic. And that, that really has led us as a profession to be outside the economic picture. Okay. And that's no wonder we, we are completely, uh, uh, you know, uh, suffering from the circumstances and we always blame ourselves. Instead of, uh, have, uh, and when you understand it in this way, that the, all these regimes that are synthetically put together in a really interesting and, yes. and co complex way, and that you can operate on any of them. Yeah, you can, yeah. Because once you poke at one, the whole system changes. Oh. What? I, I want to ask a question. What, what you say is that he's operating on things besides form, but I mean, I was really compelled by your lecture, uh, the kind of images you're showing, but you kept using this term diversity, and uh, you were showing these images that, um, to me, were quite completely like, homogeneous, and it seems like you, in a way, just oh, replaced, yeah, 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 you just no. replaced, so you're saying you just replaced the tabula rasa that these machines make with like the kind of gradient. Like no, but no, no, what I'm talking about diversity of form, it was the, the, the diversity of population. No, no, the thing is what I'm, look the, the, look, the form is driven by housing, you know. What I'm, what I'm, what I wanted to show you is that every house, let's talk not about the shape, every house yeah, that is designed here has a different price, has a different organizational possibility, has a different way of being inhabited, which basically means is that if you look at the existing model in the way how it is subdivided, yeah, it means that there never can have a conflict can have take place because the diversity that is happening within the price diversity that you can have within one thing is uh, by around plus ten yeah? percent. So what I what these models are, are actually pro conflict producers. You know, in the end, what they do is they produce the conflict that any kind of operation. Yeah, would basically resist them to build because the market or the kind of social entity that is out there would not allow that to happen. So what these models are, I am basically just showing that we've, if you take the terrain series, series yeah, 
you produce something that has to renegotiate the way how you basically want to live together. And you can only live together under some sort of uh, commitment that something doesn't uh, be at stake. So these are not shapes in the sense of the different envelopes. They are representational for uh, the housing market diversity. Can, can I ask a question? I find that, that extremely interesting because you're not promoting suburbia for its low density. You're just promoting suburbia for its lack of diversity. And that's what you're yes. that we're introducing. And because what, like the discussion in Europe, mainly about housing, is about density. Yes. And, and you don't question that. What they, well, find it, what yes. they, what they find it extremely interesting is you accept that fact, yes. and then you try to introduce more originalism into it. But actually, in, in our seminar, I mean, our studio, in my case, we are actually working on a very, very similar case. We all work on the same thing, yes. And the interesting thing is that we are dealing with, we are proposing for urban conditions, for higher densities. Yes. And I would like to know if you have been working with that, or how is density playing a, a, a role within your no. Uh, speculation? No, I mean, it's the diversity that replaces density. And so, I mean, mean if you... How no. do you deal with that? No, I mean, you see, the thing is that, that I think there are two models out there. You know, the, the one people say the only thing we can accept is the high rise. Huh? Mm -hmm. And the high rise is the only model, and we have to preserve, basically, the thing. Well, I just realized, I, I, you know, what I do is I accept the shit that these are the forces that are at stake. Now, of course, my proposals are not something that you're going to build tomorrow. But I'm surprised that someone like Keller Easterling, who saw that work, told me, uh, Peter, go out there with your uh, seven Chinese and Asians, because I'm only Asian students, you know, and build that as uh, Frank Lloyd Wright did. So, I mean, so the, the thing is, what, what I, so what I want to show is, there is a closeness to reality, but the argument is that in order to resist that or fight against another urban model, you know, you can also think that the degree of um, different population, to think it as a population, meaning as a whole gradient of social income, could also become a model to rethink suburbia in the sense that some people have to have certain jobs, some people have to have certain kind of lower distance. So even not to say I'm going to make a tram system now, yeah, I might have an opportunity instead of, because the growth is a problem of segregation as well, you know, because the economical value identifies terrains that are resistant to others to enter, you know, that's what. So, I mean, so in that, in that sense, these models are utopians, yeah, but they are real in that sense, they are, that they are out there. So my answer to density is basically uh, to rethink um, uh, the idea of a population as an entity for planning. You know, I, I think, sorry, it, it, just one point. You know, my time is short anyway. Uh, uh, the, the, what I think is very important about this is to understand it not as a project. It is not a project. One of the great problems of landscape urbanism is that it always has to have a frame around it. It's always a project. This is a completely different thing. This is much closer to self-organization, much closer to, to biology, much closer to actually what happened in suburbia, yeah. although it froze. If, but if it had continued, it's very intelligent layering of all these complexities, we might have ended up in a very different yeah. place. And that is the kind of chagrin that I feel that we never did this research. This should have been done a long time ago in order to understand it as a as a biological mechanism yeah. in a way. Yeah. That is a very different, the result is a very different architecture. I mean, you can have architects now come in and yeah. do each of these houses. They, that's they not do an they, issue. Yeah, no problem. That's not, that's you not know, what they are the Alonzos and Kiwis, and yeah. I don't know. They will make it nice, you know, and or they, they. But I mean, the thing is, of course, there is, uh, let's say, well, architecture is in so far there that, I mean, uh, you can also build that. I mean, you know, it has uh, right angles, you can put a furniture in there, you know. It's not so that it would not fit. It has to do, I mean, people say, well, it has, doesn't have to do anything with the culture of American suburbia. Well, it's also not true. I mean, the spaces that, the only thing, it, it orchestrates its spaces slightly different, yeah? But it's not so that you cannot have identify them. Yeah. No, but I mean, now that I think I have some time, uh, the, the idea, I mean, I find it 
interest in the idea of suburbia, but my question bringing back perhaps to Europe or the space of the periphery. When you say, I always like to place myself in the fringe in, in this moment where the space starts to be available. And I would just like to ask the question, what happens if the same strategy would be valid in moments where space is not available? And well, this is, well this is what we, what, I, what we do now, or what I do now Mexico. in Mexico. That's, that's because because uh, after having done three years suburb or at the edge, well, you, there are two things on the edge. The edge doesn't allow density. That's the first thing. Yeah? Just economically, there is no density on the edge. Uh, just purely because the land value is not of that. The infrastructure is not there. There's a lot of things. So, I mean, the density proposed here is a density because it is the only one feasible. Yeah? So there is an embedded density on the edge which I discovered after last, over the last three years. Because even in China, uh, we always have images of Shanghai being the one of the city center with a problem of tower. But if you look where Shanghai is growing, uh, I don't know if there is any uh, Chinese, which is the, 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 the Shannan River Delta. I mean, basically, these are suburban houses there. Why? Because this is the only ones that are economically feasible. Now, what we do in Mexico is the first time to basically intensify it as a problem of density. But again, with the different thing is that in that sense, the question is, since a lot of stuff have been um, um, uh, decayed through the earthquake, financial crisis, uh, uh, being a city that basically is empty nearly in some city centers, that's why it made an operation. You know, one thing that seems to me that they, in this model there are many opportunities to in, in, in introduce new regimes, like security. Yeah. You know, the, 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 the fear that uh, is usually uh, sort of projected fear. But in a city like Mexico, which is really yes. today one of the most fearful places, especially for, for the middle class and upper middle class, uh, that becomes a, a regime that's fundamental yes. for its for its survival in a way. So how does one introduce that yes. as a regime yes. that would alter? Yes. Uh, you you would have to kind of return to Oscar Newman's, you know, defensible space yes. and all that stuff yes. that that has kind of been forgotten. Yes. But there's so much work. In and and also and also the problem of governmentality. What do you do with a city that has no government? Yeah. So how do you provide something? where four days no administrative thing, where there's only corruption. So where you only can provide spaces for developers that see in there and open, or renegotiate ownership. You know, I mean, that's a, it's a, yeah. Wow. Any other questions? Yeah. Can you stand up so we can hear you? Oh. Uh, can I just talk louder? Uh, it seems, uh, you know, your analysis of the existing condition and how it came about seems very, very interesting. But then when it came to, like, your proposal for this new strategy, um, you said that it seemed, it seemed like, yes, this, this new plan maybe is more efficient or it could accomplish this, um, the same thing in a different and more advantageous way. The thing I think that wasn't clear to that it seemed like you were trying to uh, base it on on more of the, the natural ecology order. And I didn't see that connection with how this, this new organizational strategy was tied to the, to the quote, natural ecology. Is that question? No, yeah, look, look I mean, the, the thing I, of course, uh, um, how do you just say? What I, what, I, what I became intrigued in, in, in when, uh, is, is that guy, uh, Three Ecologies, is that Because I started to realize that I'm, that I'm totally French, you know. Sure. Uh, uh, so, all because I, I started to realize that every stuff we actually read about the thing is all French. So, the only people that really discovered or discussed the problem of ecology as a philosophical problem, as a cultural one, are only French. So, so if this is Guattari, if this is Deleuze, if this is Michel Sears, if, uh, if this is uh, Foucault, I mean, it doesn't matter, I mean, the whole thing. So, so of course, there is a danger in that, what, 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 what is it? But my hypothesis there was, 
and he wrote on the, on the question of uh, the three ecologies, uh, what came to the forefront is basically something that Foucault wrote 20 years ago, where the question comes suddenly that politics took over the way how we think about our ideas. You know? And so when he said, we talk about ecology, and it's not only a kind of biological stuff, it, it's basically a whole environment where our ideas are producing them. Yeah? And capitalism is basically the major force, or actually it, it's called political economy, yeah? that denies it. And out of that uh, process, he gives an example where he uh, gives the example of uh, a, a, a marine doctor on television made a test of uh, uh, a fish, yeah? and he had two sources of water. Yeah? One was uh, uh, the water of Marseille in Port, which is the dirtiest water nearly on Earth, yeah? and next to it there was a uh, clean water from a tap. Yeah? And so there was a, a well or a kingfish, you know, in the, in the, the deadly water, you know, and was happily surviving. And then he took it out, you know, and put it into the tap water, and within half a second it was done. Yeah? And, and, and that thing, that thing that, that probably the, the whole problem of our human species is a question um, uh, as a biological problem, that we started to be treated. Now the question is, of course, how do you think then, in biological terms, the problem of the environment? Of course, the environment is in the, in the meantime capitalism is the food production and so on. But it is also the way that probably there are ecosystems at stake that makes it possible for us to survive or not. So these were the first beginnings, you know, where I only started to realize how the economics, yeah, and the question of in that sense desert ecology start to turn to become a kind of model that only survives by both of them being basically uh, incomprehensible to each other. And the effect of that is basically that kind of uh, diversity. Yeah? So in that sense, it's the kind of first way of how you could negotiate. Now, I was today in the afternoon at the review at Grace. Yeah? And if you see all the students are sitting here, they have, we all have the same problem. The problem is, how do you produce, and we hear it, how do you produce something that is not a physical entity, but is something that is described as something that allows uh, habitation to take place? Now, that's the same question we don't know. So, in that sense, the, the biological stuff is not so much a, a, only a metaphor, is the question of how to construct a milieu in which these things can take place. Now, the modernists did it very simple. They said, okay, you die if you don't have air, so we make the distance, distance via the, the buildings uh, away from each other. You know? But I think the whole question of how uh, our milieu, how to construct one of these milieus, that's, I think, is the, is the challenging thing. And that was the kind of first attempt. So, I'd like to follow up then with just ask you to clarify, to cite an example from your presentation, you talked about the, I think that there were radiation zones or zones of heat spots in the, in the desert. Is that, did I understand that correctly? Yeah. So then, well, these are, you, what's that? These are things that are just inherited to some of that urban problems. You know, how do you yeah. And so I know that you have a process, it looks like you have a scripting process that you're using and you're able to some of that information and, and then generating these parameters. Yeah, I'm, work, I'm working but, with software that can do that. Sure. So I guess is the objective, what I didn't really understand is what is the relationship between the massing and those conditions? In other words, yes. it, it sounds like the objective well, is you have a very interesting point because you see, this is one way of how you can inhabit it. I mean, the question is, was this. Uh, uh, if you look at heat island effects, you know, they more, more or less uh, determine the question of the ratio between plants, you know, and building. Yeah? So what you, for example, see in the desert is that there where there's no vegeta uh, vegetation, basically it, it, it heats up and warms it. Yeah? And the other question is that there where you have a lot of trees, you know, it can cool down and therefore it has less form of energy and all that stuff. Now that uh, thing would be right <coughs> to say, okay, how would you <coughs> subdivide lands, yeah, if that is a problem. And now you can go to that in a very different way. You can say, wait, the land only allows certain density to be inhabited, meaning 
that uh, only there where it is uh, red or green, it can allow certain density to stay so that the overheating is not enough. So that will be one negotiation. The other thing that in that case is taken is to say, wait a minute, uh, since, it, since the land anyhow overheats, well then my building also can overheat. Yeah? So basically in order to produce another quality, we, we just frame into the problem that uh, the amount of greenery should be the same as we thought. Yeah? So I mean, the, the, the thing of how you negotiate you now the problem of, uh, of heat island effect to the terrain can of course be done in various effects. In that way it is done that every territory should have the same amount of greenery yeah? in order to produce then the variation of size. You know what's, what's uh, peculiar with the way that <coughs> architects normally work is that you take a lot and you spend some time looking at the lot, so you place the building. Then the lot disappears. There's no more longer a discussion until you go back to put some greenery back in there. While this system actually forces you to acknowledge that all of these different regimes are impinging on you every time you do something. So the design process becomes much more complicated, much more complex, but also the result is closer to, particularly if you know how to manipulate manipulate them correctly, you, it'll, it, it'll, it'll be quote unquote more sustainable. I mean the thing is that, what that's, you, yeah. That's, the, that's of course the drive behind this. I mean, the, I mean to be very honest, if you look very close to it, how it goes, you can even see in here that the courtyards are placed there where there's a plant in there. So the organization of the holes, yeah, you know, here, are basically there where the density of a certain kind of greenery. So, what it, what it happens is that suddenly uh, the building unfolds even by the organization of that. Now, uh, there isn't, I mean, only to know, I mean, because sometimes people want to know uh, all these questions, so I have these hundred pictures that are afterwards. Eh? Uh, the, uh, these are, don't worry, don't look at this, this is there, just history, but I, uh, where it all comes from. But there is uh, uh, another project, this one, for example, that, that has, for example, produced a housing type that collects water and redistributes that water into the desert. And what come up is that, that it would regenerate a kind of uh, plant ecology that only is happening due to the building there. So that means basically that the, all the, the green spots is that what is existing and all the red spots are the ones that would be other kind of species they will be reinvented. Now, this is of course hypothetical, but the building suddenly would produce kind of artificial landscape. Peter, that was one point you made that I think is terribly important. If you think about most suburb, suburban environments, they, there's virtually no relationship between the inhabitant and the landscape they live in. That has been kind of graphically represented, you know, the little trees are looking charming. And it's, here is demand on the population to behave differently because they live in a particular yes. location. That's that, of course, is the, is, is the real clue to a, to a new kind of species in which there is a, a, you know, it goes back to what Bruno Latour speaks about, which is that we have to have spokespeople for those mute species that don't speak. And, and, and this is a way of actually beginning to, 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 to make a much more integrated world. Because then you can start to choose not just which dog you're going to have, but which landscape, which trees you're going to live where. So, so that begins to really transform us as human beings and become much more ec ecologically aware. Of course, it's very demanding because most of these people also still have to go to work for the corporation. So it, 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 it kind of re reconfigures our whole existence. And this is a proposition that is now emerging in, you know, in, in the early 21st century, which is incredibly intriguing, but of course daunting, because it will totally change our world. And I think what you say, there is a really radical French now. They are not mapping, but they really uh, uh, look into, I mean, I just spoke now with, with some people, where basically every species of plant and animal, yeah, it's part, and so it's not a Swiss question of sustainability, just fixing some walls, you know, and making uh, three wall, uh, 
three windows isolated room. No, it's basically where every species that is part in a particular is remapped and understood that even cities can only work uh, uh, within that environment. So basically you can see there is a biological move in understanding the human as a species turns into politics not only by gene manipulation, but in the construction of living. Now, probably that's a little bit uh, too crazy yet, but you will see it, uh, it, becomes, uh, it becomes a problem. And if you see the project that are out there, uh, the only question we don't know yet is what is the role of architecture as a cultural entity in that process? Because the others anyhow do it, you know? I had a, I had a girlfriend in the 80s, uh, and she was a biologist. I mean, they were mapping already in that time, you know, I mean, the, the, the Germans and the Austrians were a little bit weird, you know, they, they, they thought we have to be greener than the greens, can never be, yeah? but they, they were mapping already every frog and everything, and it became part of the planning process. Yeah? But that was already 23 years ago. Okay, but, it's time for a break. Uh, yeah, and I want to say thank you.